is a uh, recognition of Sheriff Desma. I see Dr. Anderson getting forward to lead us. At this time, we uh, recognize school highlights and a, a variety of things, staff, community members, and others. And we are so excited uh, to acknowledge uh, all of the folks that made so many good things happen through ShareFest. Um, before I start, I do want to ask if Ms. Austin, who is a strong partner with ShareFest, and Ms. Bailey's not here, <coughs> but um, Ms. Bailey is Ms. Austin's uh, secretary, and if Ms. Austin wants to say some words about ShareFest, I'll turn it over to her first, and then, uh, then we'll ask Pastor Wayne to come on. Hi, good evening. Um, yes, yeah, ShareFest is uh, really a special event in our district and near and dear to my heart in particular when I was a principal and it was the first time to have that many volunteers come together to, at the time, Robinson Middle School. I actually cried <laughs> and I don't cry very often, but it was such a wonderful uh, thing to see the community uh, from people of all walks of life coming from all over our city to come together and help beautify our schools and just to network with each other is really a gift. And so um, we've been in this uh, partnership since about 2005 and uh, I personally have been working to help coordinate since 2009. So I've appreciated it so much and I know our district has and our board especially has appreciated all of the volunteerism and all of the great um, projects that have been done over the years. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you, Pastor Jeremy Wynn, so he can give us another update from his perspective. Well, guys, I just get started. I want us to thank uh, Ms. Tammy Austin because she's going to be retiring this year, I'm sure as many of you know, and she has been absolutely incredible. Um, I was able to take over two years ago, and uh, when I took over, she uh, really helped with the smooth transition, especially from the 501 side, and just always helpful, always ready to go, just makes it seamless and easy and just an incredible blessing. And so I know my, on behalf of myself and the, all the groups involved, we're gonna, we're gonna miss you dearly. And, uh, but we're really, really thankful. So can we give Ms. Tammy Austin a good one? Uh, so like I said, my name is uh, Jeremy Wynn and uh, I've been the Sheriff Fest coordinator for the last two years. and. This was Sheriff's 11th year, and so it started in 2005 um, with about two different churches involved and a couple hundred volunteers, and this year we had 30 churches involved, we had 1,600 volunteers, and we had 15 major sites, uh, majority of those being the 501 schools. And with, what I love about ShareFest is that it is designed for the church to show up and to serve with no strings attached. There's not an agenda, there's not any reason other than we just want to be a blessing. But in addition to that, we don't want any one church to be in the spotlight. You know, I think our, our city and uh, our country, you know, we can become just divided and ununified just constantly. We, you just see too much negative. And so things like ShareFest give a picture of what it looks like when we come together and we work together just for the common good of being a blessing and, and loving God and loving our neighbor. And so my highlight really um, of this year was just seeing churches from all different denominations of different backgrounds, different locations, different races, all coming together and just serving under the banner of Sheriff Fest just to be a blessing. And uh, I know as we, I went around to the different sites and Miss Austin and Dr. Anderson went around and we saw that unity in action. We saw people smiling, showing up to working. And uh, really the prayer from our Sheriff Fest team, every meeting that we had was, man, help that, that one day that we are serving together, help that be a picture of what it looks like for us to work together and serve together throughout the year. And so I love um, what I'm seeing happening uh, other days of the year um, and other efforts that are going on. And so um, at this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, have uh, we're going to show a video, we're going to show the highlights. And so you'll be able to picture a little bit about what the day looked like. You'll be able to see footage and pictures of the different sites. And, uh, and then I'll just close.
right, so hopefully you got to see kind of a little picture of what the day will look like. And just in closing, we're really excited for next year and future years. And uh, 501 Board, thank you so much for allowing us to partner with you all. Um, thank you for all that you do and other teachers in the room. Um, it's amazing, um, the hard work and uh, just everything you do day in and day out to help work with these young people. So thank you for the partnership and look forward to more of it in the future. is what he's like every day, every day, all the time, talking about how you can contribute to serve others. And that really is what leadership is. And so, and for those custodians that are out there to help get the buildings ready, and our SROs and our security team, this really, seeing those pictures, it's just half of it. It's one of the fun things to do to start off at seven in the morning with Ms. Austin, Mr. Robbins, and get to every single site. We were tired by the end of the <laughs> And then have to sing the lunch, and then the evening was the, um, a musical piece and it really is amazing. So, Pastor Lynn, we thank you uh, for all of that you do thank you so much. Uh, and all that you continue to contribute. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And so, um, with that, Ms. Austin and board members will take a picture with you, Pastor Lynn, at the end of all of the highlights. Okay. So, give okay. us about four minutes, don't leave too soon, and we have a few more highlights to do. Again, thank you so much for all that you do. I'd like to call Mr. Seitz uh, up for the next set of awards. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I too want to give a shout out uh, to the uh, Sheriff Fest coordinator and all the volunteers because what I'm going to talk about is what we do to try to keep our uh, schools and buildings looking good and we could not do it, I can promise you, with what you do year in and year out for us. So thank you so much, that, that helps us tremendously and I truly, truly appreciate it as well. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, and the distinguished board members, thank you for allowing me to uh, present again uh, the uh, Custodial Excellent Awards. I look forward to doing this every year uh, because I take great pride in uh, what uh, the people that I'm going to talk about bring to the table every year in making their facilities look so nice. So thank you again. Okay. So this year, I want to give a congratulations to the following schools and, uh, and uh, building. Uh, Meadows Elementary School, and uh, the principal being Nicole Johnson, uh, the head building operator uh, being Ray Peak, and I will announce uh, the others when I get further into my presentation. Robinson Middle School, uh, Tammy Hazelton, Todd Berry is uh, here on her behalf tonight. Um, Head Building Operator Colleen Riggs, uh, Topeka West High School Principal Dustin Dick, Head Building Operator Wayne Sherman, Sheldon Child Development Center uh, Principal uh, Shanna McKenzie, and Head Building Operator Joe Flower. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, but first off, before I go further into this, uh, I want to uh, thank Carl Erickson, uh, the custodial uh, the custodial uh, manager for the district. Uh, he uh, brings so much to the table to help me in uh, kind of keeping things together with uh, all the custodial staff in the district and uh, making sure that they're uh, up to task on everything and what have you. So I, I truly, truly am grateful for that. Uh, we all uh, at times are either invited over to somebody's house as a guest or, or we uh, are at a hotel or we go to a restaurant or whatever that might be and there's nothing that it will impress more than when you either walk inside somebody's house for the first time or if you walk in a hotel for the first time if how they're keeping uh, their uh, place both inside and outside and that's no different than uh, when we walk into a school and, and what we should expect. We should expect that that outside inside uh, looks clean, tidy, well-kept grounds and all of that. And uh, these particular people that I'm going to talk about 
do that for us. Uh, many more in the district do as well. It just so happens that we have to uh, pick out what we feel are the best in each category. And uh, again, uh, it, it shows well, and uh, we're very appreciative for what they bring to the table. So we're going to start with uh, Meadows Elementary School, whoever is here, uh, including the principal, uh, Ray Peake, Jamel Peppers, Tyler Hutton, please come forward, and Carl will give you your trophy right now. Continue through here, and you're looking at the pictures. You will see uh, that uh, by looking at the various shots of the cafeteria, the hallways, the bathrooms, the boiler room, whatever they're showing, that uh, they uh, truly do. These folks that we're talking about do an outstanding job in how they uh, keep their facilities. Okay. So now the middle school is Robinson Middle School, and again we ask that the principal and then the head building operator Colleen Riggs. The eight-hour custodian, Mark Garcia, and the night sweeper, Jordan Tetuan, all of you that are here, please come forward. school. Uh, Topeka West High School, we ask again that the principal, uh, head building operator Wayne Sherman, and any of the following, Chris Anderson, the day supervisor, and all the eight-hour custodians, Hewitt Durr, Lauren Freeman, Brendan Lawrence, Shayla Neely, Danny Rome, Paul Smith, Matt Wilson, any of you that are here, please come forward. to as uh, the specialty building category, uh, Sheldon Child Development Center. And we ask again that the principal come forward along with head building operator Joe Flower and uh, night sweeper Ezra Lewis, if she's here as well, come forward. So. say that you know not only do they keep the front of the house good the things that you would look for like when you walk into an entrance and you look at the office and the classrooms and what have you but what really to me drives home is if you walk in the back and you look at the storage closet and you look at the boiler room and you look at all of those things that are out of the public eye and you see in this particular instance how well kept they are if you are willing to take the pride look at those out of the way areas and make sure that they show well, then you darn well know that they're gonna show the front of the house well and that is what they bring to the table. So thank you, thank you so much for what you do for the district. is for our uh, assistant superintendent and our school board attorney, both of whom are retiring this year. Um, we have two things that we'd like to give you uh, on behalf of uh, staff and, and of our board. It's interesting because you know, once people know you're retiring, they get congratulated again and again and again. Uh, and so uh, as we have this final board meeting, uh, 
the first person I'd like to call up is Mrs. Cindy Kelly. Rarely does she have to come up to the podium. So uh, Mrs. Cindy Kelly is our school board attorney. She is so amazing, heart for social justice and, and just doing what's right and also making sure that all people always feel heard and seen. And that's a special gift. Um, and so with that, this plaque says, presented to Cindy Kelly, district attorney, in recognition of nine years of leadership and commitment to both the students and staff in Topeka Public Schools. With great appreciation from Topeka Public Schools, we thank you for your service. the theme in front of uh, our theme changes every year but the first two words are students first so there's a picture of administrators who have signed around the plaque for you to hang with the uh, uh, engraved on the end it says students first 2017 thank you thank you so much thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I'm a woman a few words as you know but uh, it has been a true pleasure serving this board and serving this district. Um, I hope you know how much I've enjoyed it and how much I've learned being a part of this team. So it's been, been great. Thank you. to all of our uh, retirees, our special retirees. So I will continue on with our next retiree. Um, our next retiree, uh, is it 36 or 38? It's, it's really um, 32. 32? <laughs> well, it's 34 if you count the two. Or 34. Two <laughs> <laughs> well, as young as she looks, you wouldn't believe 34, to be quite honest. So 34 years. Mrs. Austin, will you please come forward? Um, again, as she has been acknowledged multiple times, um, I don't know that there's anything left that hasn't been said. Um, I'll read her plaque as well, um, but I do want to share, out of the, all the things that I've heard, because I'm new in, in the district, um, and you know, we went out for lunch one day and she talked about her history in Topeka and being a student at Topeka High. I think that was during the Civil Rights time period. You know, and so, and, and we, we talked about kind of what that was like, and then to come full circle and to have parents and grandparents and aunts and all of these people whose lives she's touched. Not a lot of people spend 34 years in one place uh, in a profession. So it has been amazing to see, just to see all the people that she knows and, and um, how she has such a passion and heart for children. This year, one of the things that we did that was new was really have intentionality behind our service to the um, JDC. And the service to the JDC, the Juvenile Detention Center, is a piece that some people might say, what, you want me, you know, you want me to go there every day and do, and do what, and work with what? She embraced that, and oh my gosh, if you see the Juvenile Detention Center now, and the way kids are learning and staff, and um, it is really amazing and transformational. So what a, a, a wonderful piece to kind of come full circle on. With that, Ms. Austin's plaque also says, presented to Tammy Austin, Assistant Superintendent, in recognition of 25 years of leadership and commitment to both the students and staff in Topeka Public Schools. So those 34 years adds in her teaching and her subbing, um, but 25 years leading, and um, it's with great appreciation from Topeka Public Schools and also a plaque with the picture of administrators that sign. We honor you and we thank you for your service. <laughs> Didn't know this was coming tonight. Um, I guess what I have to say is who would have thought that a little girl who always wanted to be a teacher since she was the age of five and was the first in her family to go to college would graduate and become a teacher and be in a profession that she loved and then had the itch to be, become a leader 
and become an assistant principal and a principal, and then the assistant superintendent at Topeka Public Schools. And then why Topeka Public Schools? Well, I grew up in Seaman School District, K through 11, and I ended up going to Topeka High my senior year, and Topeka High staff and counselors saved my life. And they are the ones that I owe um, my career to because they helped me get into college when my parents didn't know how to help. And so um, that changed the trajectory for me. So I always wanted to give back. I love this district. I love the people. I love the board, the leadership. It's been a really joyous time. And so I really appreciate this. So thank you very much. Mr. President, I move the Board of Education approve the items of business by consent as presented and authorize the Board President or the Superintendent to sign the special project and purchasing contracts for and on behalf of the Board of Education. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Dr. McCarthy. I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge all of the tremendous work that Ms. Cindy Kelly put into item 12.2, the Code of Student Conduct, which represents just, I'm sure, months of work and fine-tuning and creation of a really fine document that is a wonderful expression of um, kind of our mission and pledge to children and, and helping them learn and what that requires. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. I just second that, so I, she emailed it to us and we got a chance to look at it. And, uh, I have to confess, that was the most I've actually ever looked at that document. <laughs> um, read, so I'm assuming that they were always that well organized and that well put together. <laughs> um, okay, any, uh, any further comments or questions on the motion? If not, the vote is open. So this is a, uh, yeah, it actually says it's for 7-1 bank reconciliations. This is covering the entire consent agenda, right? Okay. First item under the heading of superintendent's uh, report uh, is the superintendent's announcements. Uh, two very brief announcements, and then I'll turn it over to the dual language program update, which we're so excited to have. The first announcement um, that I'll mention is the uh, under the consent items, uh, one of the MOUs is with the Midwest Equity Center. We do want you to know that our equity training in the upcoming year will be in part 
through the Region 3 Midwest Equity Center. I know Mrs. Johnson and Dr. New, both Equity Council members, um, went and visited the center, had training there, and we are excited that we now will have a formal partnership uh, with the uh, equity assistance for our leaders, educators, and our educators. Uh, the other piece I also want to share with you uh, that uh, eight of our students today are at Washburn Tech, uh, and they are there as part of the leadership uh, training today uh, and throughout the course of the week amongst 20 Shining County uh, folks. Um, lastly, as we get ready to lead right into this fantastic presentation by Ms. Lucero and team, uh, is that our hiring fair today. We have 25, approximately 25 applicants um, that were interviewed throughout today, which brings me to Ms. Lucero. About uh, uh, earlier this semester, I guess about a month or so ago, uh, I asked Ms. Lucero about um, helping recruit in a creative way, and she will share a little bit about what we currently have been doing to uh, fill our dual language vacancies. Um, and um, we really weren't able to fill the vacancies that we had uh, across the district effectively. And while we know we'll be working with Go uh, Dr. Gomez to plan for dual language, uh, we also, uh, as we were planning for dual language, we also know that our ability to attract um, a bilingual staff is uh, essential. And so with that recruitment effort, um, Mrs. Lucero took the charge. And within the same day, I think, that evening, she sent me an email in which she gave a proposed cost, which is far less than what we've been spending um, to have staff come uh, and become bilingual teachers for her to actually go to them. So upon Dr. Gomez's suggestion of going to Puerto Rico, we did that most recently. As we get ready to start, we have a video that Mrs. Lucero has not seen. It will be part of our recruitment video package. This is a draft, so it doesn't have all of the folks that are in it that are going to be in it, but it is a, in its draft form as of today. So this is what teachers, parents, and others will begin to see as part of our dual language piece. Can we start the video as uh, the beginning, and then we'll turn it over to Ms. Lucero. Hi, I'm Sarah Lucero. This is my fifth year as principal at Scott Dual Language Magnet School. Scott Dual Language Magnet School is a program that services preschool through fifth grade students. Half of our students are native English speakers, and half the students are native Spanish speakers. Our mission is for our kids to be bilingual and biliterate by fifth grade. Um, they get um, math and English, science and social studies in Spanish, and we have English language arts and math language arts. I wanted to be a dual language teacher because it is very important for kids today to be bilingual and know that there is a world out there other than the where they are, the city they're in, and being bilingual myself, I wanted to share with them my experiences and help them get the tools and the skills that they have to, for this modern world. At Scott, the dual language program, we follow the Gomez and Gomez framework model, and that is from preschool, kindergarten, and first grade, the students get their language arts and their native language. We're trying to build a foundation in their native language so that starting in second grade, they can positively transfer into their other language. And these students leave bilingual in another language. So these kids, you think about the opportunity that they will have as an adult having that skill set. Also, it just really opens their horizons and seeing the world in a different way, being able to collaborate with other kids that might are from a different culture that they might not have collaborated with or communicated with before. So that's why being a teacher at Scott is amazing. I love teaching because you get to be a part of kids' life and help them realize and achieve their dreams. And so with that video, the adjustments will be, we'll have a couple more teachers in there, we'll be talking about Whitson, but we really want to make sure that, that we get the word out, that we have dual language programs and what they look like and how to recruit. I do have one additional announcement, but I'll say that at the end because it's uh, uh, off of the HR and recruitment topic, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Lucero to talk about recruitment, and then she'll also talk about a recent invitation uh, for an award as well. Ms. Lucero and team. Good evening, Mr. President and school board members. And I also have with me Mrs. Kent, our new assistant principal. But during this process, she was our dual language coordinator. So you'll notice that as we speak of her. So um, first, we were going to talk to you about our recruitment trip. So uh, Dr. Anderson and was talking on a break and said, we keep talking about going to Puerto Rico. 
let's just make it happen, no problem. So actually she said it happened in a day, and I was actually in professional development, so behind the scenes, Michelle was back there working all the, what was needed to done be done, so that's why the proposal happened. So um, now we, um, on the next slide, oh, I can click, thank you. So, um, Oh, there it goes, a little extra on the back. So um, when we went back, this slide actually has a typo, as Michelle had pointed out. Um, we recruited four teachers. I don't know how I forgot about this, but we also brought back a SPED teacher. So it just so happened we had a SPED teacher resign, and we met this SPED teacher, and she was phenomenal. So we have brought back a preschool teacher, a kindergarten teacher, a second grade teacher, and a SPED teacher for our school. It was um, pretty neat. We didn't know that many people, so we um, just started networking with people that we knew. We had a person apply. We started asking all the references on people to apply. Do you know people? Do you know other people we could connect? Um, Michelle conveniently picked the hotel and the location where schools were closing, so it wasn't your ideal dream place in Puerto Rico. I think everybody imagined us being on the beach or something, but we were in an area that we knew that there were more teachers that we could um, grab. So I'm going to have Michelle talk some too, so you can hear from her as well. Um, in addition, we also um, put together a application or not an application an announcement that had all the information of how you would qualify to be a teacher, and so we put it on a couple of Facebook pages in Puerto Rico. And little by little, the application started coming in. Um, we also um, used the indeed.com um, site, which Ruth would um, filter through some of the applications, and as soon as we got them in, we were making contact with them, emailing them, and then setting up interviews when we were able to get down the specific details for our trip. Um, Oh yes, and then I was on the phone with a Puerto Rican newspaper that um, took out an ad that ran for the whole week. In addition, they also have kind of a Craigslist hiring site as well, and so we put our announcement on there on a daily basis, um, and so that was another way that people told us that's how they heard of us coming to um, Bayamon, which is where we were at in Puerto Rico. Um, and then, actually also in the lobby area, we talked to one of the concierge, and he, came up and gave us his resume. He actually was stationed at Fort Riley. He had um, a business, uh, his business admin degree and he was interested in applying for a position here in Topeka as well. So it was just kind of, you know, word by mouth and, um, you know, somebody knew somebody else or I have a cousin or a sister. So if for us not knowing anybody in Puerto Rico, it was a success. And um, then it was also we just interviewed right there in the hotel lobby. They, we had a little section on the side, so people come in, we met them right there. So we didn't have to mess with the cost of renting a room or anything. And so overall, the trip cost us about the same amount that we would normally spend paying the state of Kansas to get a Spaniard into our district. Not the overall salary, Nancy, <laughs> but just the retaining fee that we pay for four teachers that is what the, we pay the state for one. So we were really excited about that. And our hope is with the Puerto Ricans that we are going to um, find teachers who want to plant their roots here. I always feel like Topeka is a wonderful place to raise a family and um, we need to market that more. So that's what we really did over there. Talked about our zoo, our zoo here and all the parks and what a wonderful place that costs the living slow. And we knew that there were other com you know states that were there we were competing against. We, we really sold how wonderful this district is and we're going forward. And it was really one thing that I loved was that a lot of them knew other people that had been in the United States and Kansas was known for the kind people. So they really Really wanted to move to the Midwest because they heard how great the people were here so that was a plus for us and um, so we also um, uh, this is the first year as a principal that I have not had a Spanish language teacher vacancy this time of the year so yeah <laughs> which is very exciting and in fact I'm we're working with these other two that recently have contacted us and we may actually get a surplus which is 
phenomenal. So it's the first time I'm working harder to find English applicants than Spanish applicants. That's definitely a success. In the past years, we have had four, five to six Spaniards, which is the visiting teaching program at our school. And I think it's an excellent program. I would like to maintain it and possibly have one or two at a time, just because of the diversity that they add to our whole program, our partnership with the Embassy of Spain, the rigor of academic Spanish they bring to our kids is phenomenal. However, um, it shouldn't be something we rely on to keep sustain the program. It should be an accent. So, and as Michelle put it best, our Spaniards usually come for the experience, but our Puerto Ricans are really coming for an opportunity for a life changing event. So, I'd also like to mention our dual language coordinator, now Michelle has assisted in securing 10 of our 11 Spanish language vacancies this um, year. She went recruiting all around Kansas, and that's where we started first. She went to almost every single job career fair. You want to speak about that, Rosa? Sure. Um, yep. Uh, Ruth and I, we call, she calls it her road warrior. And we start in, um, we did uh, UMKC, Pittsburgh, Emporia, K-State, and KU. And um, she's the one that goes out there, and she finds any student that is either bilingual um, or they're um, uh, Spanish K through 12 candidates. And then she sends them my way. Um, we took the district questions that we usually ask at the preliminary interviews and we translated them into Spanish. And then we also recorded what their answers were. So if we needed a second opinion on how strong their Spanish was, I could bring it back and share it with the team. Um, and we were happy that we were able to fulfill 10 of the 11 positions um, locally. And they, well, not uh, locally, but we were able to fill, I think, eight of them by university students and then um, the other couples were from Puerto Rico. That, having that dual language coordinator has been a strong piece in helping our program sustain and at both schools she's helped recruit for. So I'd like to go ahead and change gears a little bit and tell you about exciting news. And let me ask this, are there questions? Because you know, really going over and beyond in terms of recruitment has made a tremendous difference in our pipeline. And we uh, thank you and applaud you for just a phenomenal job. Thank you, ladies. Are there questions for any board members before she uh, shifts gears to the next uh, piece? I really didn't think you spent that kind of money. <laughs> I was just giving her a bad time because it read that way when if you just read the article. Um, the, but the thing about it that I'm going to ask is that you've, you've been there once now. So this, that is going to be a pipeline for us as we have to, as we expand our program. We've got more, you know, we're looking at things that are going to be going on in high school. I mean, there are all sorts of things happening. So our, do, you have a, do you have a sense about how much more we need to do to sort of establish ourselves there. I mean, I'm assuming you're going to be going, we'll be sending them back again to, to do this, but you're going to have some places you know to go now. I mean, I, I guess I'm asking you, what have you a sense of how much more you have to do um, before like somebody else can do it for us? You just didn't have to do it yourself? Well, I think that's a dialogue to have because originally we did talk about trying to have somebody else to do it for us. And because of cost reasons, it, it was for us an eight, like a fourth of the cost for us to do it ourselves. Right. However, a side effect that I didn't think about until we did it is we got to meet these candidates ourselves and make our own decision about who we thought was high quality and fit to pick up public schools. And so there is a benefit of having a Topeka Public Schools representative go as far as it being someone else within our district or maybe possibly one of our teachers that is charismatic, great at recruiting that has Puerto Rican connections. Um, so that's a dialogue to happen, I would say, you know, going in the future. The other thing is there's great potential right now in this possibly fulfill, filling other vacancies that we have shortages in our district. I know science teachers are hard to find and the shape that their economy is in right now, and there's a lot of teachers that have very strong English skills. And so like one teacher who's come to teach um, uh, sped for us. She actually teaches kindergarten with 37 students, students with severe emotional disturbance disorders with very little support. So she feels like she's coming to heaven. So it's not just the economic, it's their professional growth that they've been looking for too. So. I assume you have a plan, but how are you going to integrate uh, these people into um, because of society and um, schools. 
A wonderful question. We're going to mimic what we did with um, Spain with the Spaniard teachers, and so we um, are looking for community mentors. We already have one in the room, <laughs> and we already have another one. Actually, one of our retired teachers, if you guys know Miss Iris Bridges, who is Puerto Rican, she has agreed to be um, a community mentor and is helping as well. Um, we're also working on helping find their husbands' jobs, and so we're just kind of mimicking that same. Um, plan that we had with them. And, and I guess on that topic, when you talk about finding jobs and everything, what's so beautiful and what's so easy is these are American citizens. Mm -hmm. This is the territory of the United States. Um, it is, there are no requirements you can come here and work, just, you know, I mean, it's, it's the equivalent of Oklahoma, and, um, and it almost is budget wise, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm, first of all, I just want to tell you how excited I am and applaud your work in going to do this so fast. This is something, yes, yes, both of you. Uh, this is something that uh, we were, we just discussed and we had just started to push uh, pretty hard. And uh, we talked about it, of course, with our administration and you all deserve applause as well. We just put it in the strategic plan uh, and it's already done. So we approved the strategic plan when? February, yeah, yeah, and and so now we've already moved way down the road on that. So you're to be applauded for for making that happen. Uh, I think it's it's great news uh, because in my experience, so I've um, hired hired a couple of people from Puerto Rico uh, in the last couple of years. It is my experience that it is ten times easier to get them to stay uh, than it is, you know, a person from California. There is more similarity. And you know, culturally between Kansas and Puerto Rico than there is California and Kansas. So uh, the odds of retaining them is, is, is a lot better. So I'm excited about that. Um, the other big thing that I wanted to ask you, just uh, working in, in HR but not in education, uh, what is it like when you're recruiting uh, teachers from, from Puerto Rico uh, right now, as you mentioned, there's a great opportunity because uh, the economy is kind of in the tank. Uh, and you have all of these people who are all bilingual, all of them. I mean, that's just the way it works there in terms of education. And they, historically, all of their universities are really strong in math and science because they're a, an island in the middle of the ocean, and so everybody gets a bioscience background really strong. Uh, when you start thinking about uh, hiring folks, what are some of the things that you see uh, being offered? I guess, did you get to talk to any of the people about what your competition is offering? I'm thinking specifically uh, like relocation packages, things like that that we factor in when we try to recruit someone. And that was one of the things that relocation packages, they asked those kind of questions and we told them, you know. Uh, so they're used to hearing yeah, that. Yeah, they're used to hearing that um, and then, the more of um, teachers who had family in the Orlando area, where their income was, uh, their salary was higher than what we are, what ours, what we were offering was, and then we had explained to them the cost of living was much lower here compared to Orlando, and so then they started researching on their own on how that was true and um, how their money would get them a little bit more further here in Topeka compared to Orlando. So as we expand these efforts in the future, we could probably put together a, you know, a nice snappy, um, you know, slick brochure that explain kind of what the cost of living is and what the dollar would buy here yeah. versus. Now the relocation package is a big thing because the families are moving here and not getting yeah. their first paycheck till September 18th. Right. So we really that was actually part of our questioning. We and they're moving here. here. Yeah, and they're not keeping a house back like, no, like our Spaniards do. So that was one of our screening questions we asked them, do you have enough financial funds to sustain your family until yeah, September 18th? So that is a big challenge. So it did, it did beat out some care. Some yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder, so I have a friend also on the board, in, on the board one of the boards in Johnson County, in Blue Valley, and obviously we don't compare ourselves to them. Uh, but they also recruit there. And what they do is they give, uh, stipend from the beginning, you know, to call it a relocation package or whatever. I don't know if that's something they had to work out with negotiations, but uh, I know they also do it for some of their other shortage areas with teachers. They'll just bump their stipend up and 
hope it, it covers something. Yeah, and that's what we experience with bilinguals in other states. When we try to recruit in other states, they often get bilingual side Other questions? Yeah, so we got some work to do. <laughs> yeah, but we've started. Okay. So creative recruiting. So you're hearing a little bit about that on the This Month in Bilingual Studies series. Creative recruiting. Yeah, so we have some creative recruiting tools that we use in our classes. Um, we use Google Sheets. Um, we use Google Docs. 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 Um, we use this opportunity and we'll be asking uh, if there's a desire to proceed forward. Ms. Lucero? Yes, so we were um, approached by the Embassy of Spain and asked to become an international Spanish academy and um, this is very exciting because very few schools are chosen for this. We will become the first and only school in the state of Kansas if we do proceed with this. There are a total of 136 schools in the network in Canada and the U.S., just for you to kind of have a mindset. Um, some of the benefit, one of the most exciting things that I'm really excited about is our fifth graders will actually graduate with their Certificate of Excellence in a dual language program that is from the Embassy of Spain. So um, then also they will have sister schools that they get to partner with to gain those language opportunities. Michelle will share some of the staff Yep, so our staff members will actually also have the opportunity to participate in some uh, foreign language courses during the summertime to either help improve or to start their bilingual skills. Um, they'll also get um, access to some Spanish resources that we might not have available to us here in the U.S. since there'll be mostly um, resources coming from Spain and then as well as the scholarships. Oh, um, our Spanish language assistant program. So that's something that we kind of thought about. It was something that we would have to plan for next year, but it's an individual that comes to our school four days a week and um, they are in charge of building um, language in the classrooms as a support as well as um, assisting with cultural, more cultural activities in our school and um, just kind of giving us another um, outlet to experience Spanish for our students. Questions about that program? Questions for the board members? What's the negatives about it? <laughs> yeah, I, we don't know. We're no, <laughs> no special resource commitment on our part? Or? No, we don't have any financial resource. and. It's purely by selection. So, so check there. That's yeah, fine. there was no application. Well, we had to follow up and give them information, but they selected us because they saw the um, level of excellent. excellence that we were giving in Spanish. So. No one else has been invited to do it. Yeah. They want us to do it. Our teachers get all these extra resources. It makes Topeka a destination. So, yeah, you know, this is fun because we have somebody in here actually in the room from Go Topeka from the economic development arm of the chamber. Uh, Stapleton uh, and when you start to think about who really cares uh, about a school that's going to produce you know 500 a year you know uh, this army of bilingual biliterate interculturally competent people who can work across cultural boundaries I just texted my colleagues <laughs> <laughs> so, you, know, you, you think about what that means um, beyond the economy but uh, but even the part that I think for all of us board members too, uh, we love the fact that for all of our students who are native Spanish speakers, mm -hmm. and there is culture that is inextricably linked to that language, we're validating it. It really matters. We're showing them there's that foundation to build off with the rest of their education. So, um, I mean, I think I'm seeing head nods around the table. Uh, I don't think there would be any, there should be any hesitation. So, I mean, it sounds to me like the next step should be they go out and pursue it uh, when they actually have something final to bring back to us for the administration and we'll have to approve it but yeah, I mean am I, am I so so the school can proceed forward with exploring this and keeping us posted in terms of other next steps that we need to do thank you both for bringing this piece and for all of your work with uh, the dual language program right. tell us how we can help yes Oh, and one final thing, I did bring some data and I did want to tell you just how well that our, we are finding that our dual language students are performing in comparison to the ELL students in the district. We're really excited about that and we're show, it's showing that on the state assessments that their language acquisition, they are getting it. So you are investing in a program that are showing results. So thank you for that. We do have one question, Mr. Mickelson, Dr. Mickelson. So along the lines of how we can help, and I don't know if you know the specifics of the 
spouses of your teachers, and they, you said they you were looking to have help them find employment. What other skill sets do you know? Well, we have one that we found a job. He had CDL. Mm -hmm. We'll have to go back and look yeah, at one that. One's going to stay at home because they have a baby. Behind. They have a baby. Um, and if I can interject with that, with all of the staff that they have, we'll send you the list of those individuals. But really, the pathway then would be as they recruit people to really have the list um, and then asking our uh, chamber partners. <laughs> yeah. um, in fact, I just met with Matt Kovarnik uh, yesterday, and his thing was, How can we help? Uh, not knowing this piece until the presentation. Um, but, you know, sharing with our chamber partners, board members, and saying, here are the staff we need to place. That's for dual language, but that's also for other people who move here specifically to work in Topeka. Thank you for asking that question. Again, I think our creative recruitment efforts are um, pretty fantastic right now. So we're excited about continuing to fill vacancies that other um, So I take it everybody got a chance to look at this. Um, the only thing that would be uh, different than it is, it's, was right the, the one that we moved around Fourth of July time next year. Right? Anything different? Yeah. yeah. Does, so. does that still make sense that twenty point two board would like to change the end of your fiscal meeting from Thursday, June twenty first, to Monday, June thirtieth, two thousand seventeen? No, so this is one thing that we wanted to change. So, um, Wait a minute. Those will be yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we have. That's right, Yeah. But it's, we will want to change. That one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think they should say Friday. Yeah, we're going to say Friday. All right. Any questions? If not, I think we're probably ready to entertain a motion. Uh, Ms. Kirk, was that a second? No, I, actually, I was looking at something and I lost her, what you were saying. It was, yeah, no, I'll second it. Thank you, thank you, Ms. I Kirk. Thank you. It. The motion and a second. I was rubbing my head because I couldn't figure out what this was said here. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? I think we're ready to vote. Thank you, Ms. Lester. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a change to the end of year meeting. Uh, so traditionally, we this is our closing the fiscal year meeting. It's a new meeting. It's usually very quick. Uh, I think the longest one that we've ever had has been like 30 minutes, and that's because we had to have some presentation over some action we needed to take before the end of the fiscal year. We don't have that this time. Uh, so it'll probably be a quick meeting. Uh, however, <laughs> I think we originally thought we'd be able to do this on the 31st, um, or was it the 29th? Thursday, June 29th. So yeah, that's what we had. And then it says Monday, June 30th, which is in No, it should be Monday, June 26th. So, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. It, it's, it's listed incorrectly. So, the thing with the 29th. Um, I am gone, Dr. Morrison is gone, Dr. McCarthy is gone, Dr. Anderson is gone, um, and I, are, Dr. Mickelson, are you gone also? Okay. Are the other four still going to be here on that day? June the 30th, when it was the 29th? 29th was the original day. Yes. I can do the 26th. You, you, okay. Cause us three will be gone as well as the superintendent. So I wanted to move this back to the 26th. That's still enough time. I've been uh, our next told. Meeting. Our next meeting. Yeah. Our next meeting. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's the noon meeting. Yeah. If that works for everyone. On the 26th? Yeah, so this, this way, Dr. Uh, Morrison and Dr. McCarthy will be gone, but the rest of us will be here. So if there are no objections to that, then we thank you, Reverend Williams. Yeah. 
there a second. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Uh, yeah, the, so the date is uh, is yeah. listed incorrectly. Gotcha. There's a motion to second. Any discussion on the motion? It's none. Then I think we're ready to vote. discussion item for the evening is uh, proposed policy changes uh, on discipline and the meal charge policies. Kelly. Right, I'll talk about the meal charge policy first. Uh, this is required by new federal regulations governing the school lunch program and it requires that we have a policy on how kids can charge meals and also how we're going to collect debt with regard to meals. Um, Basically what the policy says is we won't let kids go hungry. They can always charge the regular school lunch. Anything that's a la carte is simply not chargeable. So, but you can always get the regular school lunch. Um, and then basically parents, if they have unpaid balances, will be given notices that, they're, that they have unpaid balances. And ultimately it goes to collections if it gets over $25 in the hole but we're required to have this kind of policy and let parents know what the policy is. Any questions? <clears throat> Ms. Kelly, um, I remember um, an incident where um, at, um, at Topeka, it was at Topeka High, the child went in, didn't have an ID, and the um, per the end was uh, was unable to eat lunch because it didn't have the ID. So, does this policy address that type of situation? It doesn't address the issue of what kind of identification you need to show in order to show that you're a student and able to eat. It does address the issue that if the student didn't have money in their account or um, you know, didn't have money with them to pay for lunch that they would still be able to eat a lunch that day. They would not be able to eat those items that are considered a la carte and charge them, but they would be able to get the regular school lunch for the day. Uh, well, it, to me, I mean, if somebody forgets their ID, they still should be able to eat. Absolutely, and I would hope that that uh, isn't something that happened recently or this year, but if, whether it did or didn't, uh, that's certainly a policy or procedure or practice we can most definitely reinforce. Because, you know, if the student forgets their ID, they can go to any school administrator that's uh, in the cafeteria at the time and share they've forgotten their ID, and they can confirm that they're a student. If a student forgets their ID, they can give their name to the cafeteria worker who can look their name up and see that their student and their picture is there. And so, um, you know, outside of this, if there's a specific situation, we can address it, but certainly we will uh, remind all of that procedure um, so that all kids have access to the food. Um, and if they forget their ID, that's not a, a reason as to why they would not uh, be provided lunch. Thank you for sharing that. And this doesn't address that directly, but it certainly creates the philosophy that kids ought to be able to eat. <laughs> the second of the policies uh, is a comprehensive change to our discipline policy. And really I'd characterize the changes as two major changes. One, all of the information with regard to special education students when it comes to special rules that apply in suspension or expulsion situations have been moved to a specific section at the end of the, of the uh, passages. And a lot of what you see there is stuff being moved around to make that occur. Um, under The way the policy was written before, much of that occurred within various sections of the policy and I think made it very hard for parents to read. I've even run that past uh, Dr. Harrington and she agrees that it will be much more easy to use uh, in this way. The other thing is we've taken out all of the lists of offenses and the recommended consequences for those offenses and moved them to the code of student conduct that you approved earlier. 
so there's there are references to the code of student conduct in the discipline policy, uh, but for the most part, what the what the what we consider to be offenses and how we're going to deal with them are dealt with in this document, which also looks at five levels of offenses, uh, levels of consequences rather than the three that we had before. Um, it, it adds references to uh, the alternative school that we hope to have in place next year and students being able to be placed in the alternative school and what those procedures will be for, for placing a student in the alternative school. So those are the three major changes to the discipline policy. Uh, everything else kind of falls in line in one of those three categories of, of, of things. I'd be happy to answer any questions or my policy committee me me members have been uh, dealing with these policies for a long time now as we've been trying to get them in shape. Uh, so if, any, if you have any comments, that would be great. Or if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. The version that's posted online of the policy contains comments by every change to let you know what the change was. So that it's explained in depth online on the copy of the policy that you have online. I was just going to suggest that one of the things that we had to do too as we were doing this, it was hard to read this and, and, and keep track of where, where your thinking is. Like you need to have the student code of conduct with you. If you have that, it helps to, um, to see where well, all these things have been moved. <clears throat> and it works. It just it's hard to read, but if you would work with both documents, you can better see how it all fits together. I mean, we had to do that as we were putting these things through, go back and forth and, and look. And, and part of this came about because of the juvenile justice um, changes to um, in the MOU that we have with the, the officers and, and the, the police department and things here in, in the city. So a lot of it fits into all, it, it all fits together. And Cindy is, is Dr. McCarthy has already said, did a, a, a huge job. This was very, very yeah. complex. And we host the city for getting it done. I said, she needs these all. So I said, and I've always been that oil you burn to get this done. But um, it, it was a huge, huge job. We owe you great credit. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kirk. I, do, I would say that um, online you have the version that has all of the, the corrections in it. At your, uh, at your desk, I've given you a copy of both the Code of Student Conduct and a copy of the Discipline Policy with those uh, changes incorporated, since sometimes it's kind of hard to see what, where, and, and what, what I've done with certain types of things, so that gives you what would potentially be the finished version of the policy. Any additional questions or comments at all for Ms. Kelly or for any of the three members on the policy? Not, um, this item will move uh, in our, as an action item at our next board meeting. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, get them to Ms. Kelly or any of the policy committee members between now and next meeting. Thank you all for good work. A lot of it. Okay, our last item on the agenda tonight is board member comments. I think we'll start at the very end with Ms. Kirk and we'll work our way down and uh, try to get out before hail. Before hail, I think it's already gone. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice for some reason. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say um, another official thank you to Tammy and, and, and uh, Cindy. Uh, they've been incredible worker bees behind the scenes. Most people don't even see half of what they have to do when they're doing it, especially with Cindy. I mean, how many people have to see the attorney? I mean, we just know that she's been there and she's been a huge help to us um, from the time she came on board. It was a whole different approach to serving our students than we had previous to this. And I, I just say thank you for that. Um, and I also say thank you to Susan Duffy. Um, when she first presented this, I mean, we had a full conversation about it, and I thought, oh, this is great. Now we can just figure out how to pay for it. 
Um, this was long before we had any idea whether or not we were going to have a block grant again or, or actual um, formula that dealt with all the special issues that we all have. So I'm, I'm really excited about that potential for our kids. And, and um, things are just, you know, this is a year end. It's winding up with some sadness for me, but it's exciting. All these things moving on that we're doing. So thank you, board. It's exciting. I won't say much because I tend to get emotional, and you both know how I feel about you. I will miss you very much. Um, I can't imagine to be in public schools without you, so that will be an adjustment for us, but um, thank you for your service to our kids and for your friendship and guidance and help. I want to thank you too, but I just want to tell you that retirement is very good. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I, I uh, what uh, Ms. Duffy has uh, proposed uh, for for our students to attend class, we we have very good data that students who attend class regularly at the 95% level, or at least above 90%, um, have much better student achievement. So anything we can do to get kids to school is very important for um, student achievement. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna pass tonight. <laughs> Okay, if uh, there are no more comments, I think we are ready for a motion uh, to adjourn. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Mickelson. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion unseen? Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>